So this is the Innovation Conversation. I'm Kevin Coop. And I'm Tom Furphy. We're back. So Tom, there was a, a, a podcast conversation that I had with Sterling Hawkins that actually hasn't dropped yet, uh, a Retail Tomorrow podcast. But he said something that I thought was really interesting that I wanted to explore with you. He made the point that one of the things that software developers always do before they release it to the public is they stress test it, right? They throw as much at it as they can to kind of create, create the worst possible scenario to see if they can handle it. And his point was, that's exactly what's happened to the retail business, the food retailing business now, right? It has been stress tested, not on purpose. And so it, it's almost impossible to imagine more stuff being thrown at it than has been thrown at it in the last you know, month or six weeks. Uh, yeah. Uh, so definitely, yeah, I mean, that definitely happens in software that, you know, you can run transactions through and variability and all this kind of crazy stuff and you simulate it, right? And it's, it's just a bunch of data and it's the software behaving certain ways with data. And then, you know, you'll have users bang on the software and do different things with it and all that to make sure that it's giving you the right, you know, user experience around those, those cases and edge cases as far out as you can go. I don't think any software designer uh could have could have could have predicted what's happening now right i mean it, the software certainly has been stressed has, or stressed but really more importantly it's this combination of the way people are shopping right this this crazy surge in demand the um you know the the challenges in the supply chain right and 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 then also you know sh shortage in labor right so you've got all of the variables that impact e-commerce, right? So you have the, the software, you have products on the shelf, you have the ability to go uh, pick those those products, and then you have, you know, customer scheduling uh, delivery or pickup slots, and even now new ways to deliver, right, with contactless delivery, right? So uh, you, you've thrown this like massive volume uh, of variability uh, into the system uh, all at the same time. Really, it's the, it's the ultimate stress test. And it's not just, I mean, it's not just the e-commerce side of it that's been stress tested. It's also the stores, right? The stores Absolutely. have been put through, I mean, uh, you know, more, more challenges in the last few weeks than they, they probably ever thought they'd have to deal with. Um, you know, the idea that Amazon, Amazon, Kroger, Walmart are hiring hundreds of thousands of people to sort of, um, to just to keep up with what they've got to do. I mean, who would have dreamed that would have been possible? The idea that the idea that that companies are, are are now reaching out to you know hotel companies and food service companies to say send us the employees you're firing because we'll take them all. Yeah, <laughs> you know it's crazy. It is crazy. You know, we've spent the last 20, 30 years um, basically fine tuning you know retail, fine tuning retail models to deliver. Uh, you know, to deliver a good customer experience as efficiently and kind of as tightly controlled as possible. Because to do that at scale, to do that with consistent quality, right, to deliver value and to ultimately deliver profits back to your company, you have to have the machine pretty finely tuned. Finely tuned machines can work well, you know, even with a, with a with accelerated rate of growth, maybe, you know, 5, 8, 10 percent of growth, a fine-tuned machine can kind of adapt to that. When you all of a sudden throw, you know, 30, 40 percent demand surge uh, onto that fine tuned machine, it's it it's not meant to understand that kind of and handle that kind of, of volume increase. And, um, and and so I, I think that, you know, we've obviously thrown this system uh, a whole bunch of variables that it never could have expected. And, um, you know, retailers didn't have the size staff that they need to accommodate this uh, this growth. There's not enough delivery folks. Um, you know, to, to handle this level of growth. On the Amazon side, there aren't enough people uh, to pick these products uh, in the facility. You know, Amazon gears up for holiday season, right? And they hire a couple hundred thousand more people for holiday season, but they anticipate that. And they start that hiring in August and September, you know, to get the folks hired for late October and early November. Um, so, you know, to, to do it as quickly as uh, the industry has done and responded has actually been quite, uh, quite remarkable. And it's interesting because I think what's going to happen now, I mean, inevitably, there was a story from the Associated Press the other day that I reported on in which they were talking about the fact that um, 
you know, you've got you've got retailers and delivery companies, right, who have who are right now doing more business than they've ever done before. But they're now faced with a choice, right? To what extent do we invest? Mm -hmm. And because it the volumes may not be this way forever, it's going to take if you even if you make the investment, it's going to take time for that to to build whatever it is you have to build. Right. And so, and so at some level they're gambling, they're going to, they feel like they're going to be making a gamble. And I would imagine this is even, I mean, as hard as it is for big companies, right? Cause the, cause the, the, the size of the investment is so much bigger. It's almost more dramatic for a small company. Cause while the investment dollars may not be as big, they may be, it's a much bigger gamble for companies that don't have those kinds of resources. And I think it's going to be a real, it's going to be a really interesting challenge for 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 businesses to decide. Okay, you know, again, they're at the table. They've got to decide where they put their money down, where they're going to put their chips down. I think that that's both a kind of a short term and a longer term challenge. Um, it's hard to invest capital in the short term, right? So to to make capital improvements quickly to be able to you know satisfy a current um you know a current situation or current dynamics i think is pretty pretty tough in the short term you can hire more staff you can you know maybe make some changes to the software in the near term you can figure out you know how to uh how to handle the surge you know with humans and, and doing things that way that that's kind of one thing and i don't think you can get too burned uh, on that um you know because labor can ultimately be flexed in and out and um so i don't think that's that's you know too major of a well it's a challenge but that's not so much about investment i think you know if you think about capital investment and new capabilities um i think what we've just seen or we're seeing over the last you know month and we're going to see over the next couple of months you know absent the supply chain disruptions and all that but i think this surge in e-commerce volume i think we've gotten a glimpse you know two years out from now Right. We were on a pretty nice growth trend um, in e-commerce generally. And basically what we've done is we've leaped, you know, kind of two years forward um, in the overall e-commerce volume. So depending on which retailer you talk to, you know, they might be doing anywhere from, you know, 10 percent to 35 percent in e-commerce now, you know. And who knows exactly what that average is to, um, you know, maybe it's, you know, 20 percent just for argument's sake. I think we were always saying that we'd get to 20 percent, you know. 2023, 2024, um, you know, so um, I think we're getting we're getting that look sooner. So I think it gives it should give retailers a sense for, you know, when we get to this level of volume, here's the types of capabilities we're going to need to have. Right. So what are the offerings we need? We, we need to have for our customers. You know, how can we help them shop better? Uh, you know, things like recommendations engines and and auto replenishment and, you know, good uh, product information and you know, aiding product discovery and traceability and all that stuff to be able to do that at scale. Um, how do we uh, build a great omni experience that involves pickup, that involves delivery, right? That that enables all of that. I think you're getting, you, you've got kind of this uh, this kind of short term. I don't really want to call it a draft rehearsal because nobody was quite ready for it, of course. But I think it gives you a sense for where the world can be. And I, I, we've 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 mentioned this before. We've referenced this before. Um, and you hear Jeff Bezos talk about it to uh, investors uh, often. Um, and he says, you know, we're not really building and operating the company for this quarter, right? We're, we're thinking out two, three, four years ahead, and we're building to that. Um, and, you know, Amazon has always been pretty good at envisioning what that world can look like. Um, they articulate it internally. They do they R&D toward that. They, you know, they build toward that. And when you're inside Amazon, you really do feel like you're three years out in the future because that's the stuff you're working on. Um, I think the rest of the industry has gotten a look over the last month at what this world could be like three years from now. And I think they need to, to really think about, you know, this reality and how that this, this should impact, you know, what they invest in. And it might vary for each retailer, you know, it's not to say, well, you should do micro fulfillment. You should do, um, you know, only click and collect. You should do auto replenishment. You know, it's really up to each retailer, however they want to service their customers and the experience they want to build, but they really need to be thinking about these capabilities now. And it seems, it seems to me that one of the things they really have to be aware of, I think, and uh, it, it, 
is the notion of the, their brand and their and their value proposition, right? Because I mean, right now, I mean, quite frankly, toilet paper has become the great equalizer. If you have it, people will come into your store, um, and, and and then you won't have it long, right? And then and so, um, but it seems to me that you know that's not going to last forever. It might last six more months. Mm-hmm. Who knows? Eight months. Who knows how long that will last? But at some point, that will that will pass. Yep. And it'll be the retailers who really have a sense of how they're different and then are able to sell that, you know, communicate it really well to the consumer. Those will be the ones that 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 will be able to launch themselves into this sort of accelerated future at warp speed that you know they didn't expect they'll be able to handle it better the the you know the the um the stress they will take less stress on their on their systems i think so i mean we we always talk about you know being customer centric right and right now if you have toilet paper you're by default customer centric because that's what customers want and right so you you're solving a real customer need by having toilet paper um but i do think the grocery industry you know, and not only grocery stores, but anybody that serves these essential products, um, you know, you've become a lot more valuable to your customers uh, over this last month. Um, you have an amazing opportunity right now to continue to appeal to them. But appealing to them in two, three, four months or one or two years from now is not going to be it's not going to be the same way you would appeal to them, you know, uh, recently. So you're going to have to think about you know, understanding your customers. What are the things that are important to them? What what do they wrestle with in their daily lives? How can you save them time? How can you save them cost? How can you make things more convenient? Um, you know, how can you enrich their lives with better product discovery, better nutrition, you know, better sensory experiences like we talk about? You know, it, it's it's kind of time to start thinking about that. Um, I, I, would, I would hope most retailers had been thinking about that. And I know everybody's in crisis mode now and, and you know, start solving today's needs are first and foremost, but you really got to start to be thinking forward because it's it's just it's really really responsible to do so, and you've got such a good opportunity right now, you know, with your customers really relying on you. Well, that's it for this edition of the Innovation Conversation. Um, as always, we'll be back in two weeks with another edition. I'm Kevin Coop, and I'm Tom Furphy, and we'll see you next time, everybody. <laughs>